Welcome back to the Down South Hunting Podcast. This is Mike Higman, your host, and I'm coming to you courtesy of the Onyx Hunt app. And guys and gals, it is the time of year. I, the other day I was outside, I told my wife, I think I almost felt like a little bit of a cool breeze hitting me first thing in the morning. It was gone in an instant, but I know that time is coming soon when we are going to be in the woods. The other time that has come around is college football season, which I was really excited about for, um, well, it's pretty much over now. As a Florida State fan, uh, their season's over. I can be 100% focused on, on hunting now. But I know for a lot of the rest of you across the Southeast, it's a pretty exciting time of year uh, with college football going. It's that little bridge that you probably need to get going till, till hunting season. So this week, we are going to be talking to Jeff Danker. That's somebody that I have wanted to have on the podcast ever since we started, uh, way back in the Major League Bowhunter days. Uh, he always impressed me with his, his knowledge and the way they would teach uh, stuff that you don't normally hear about on, on hunting shows. You know, they get in depth about access and, um, you know, why they're hunting certain areas and, and why they're doing different moves. And, and a lot of times they go the extra mile. To, to get in a, a close in a, on a buck and being mobile. So uh, we get into some of that stuff. I think uh, there's a lot of cool stuff to learn about. Another cool thing is Jeff is getting into some, some new things on his own from the production side, and they're getting some more into the public land hunting. And, uh, you know, he's honest about it. It's something that he's learning about as he's, as he's going along. He's taking these private land tactics and adapting them to, to public land. So it's pretty fun talking to him about that as well. Make sure you're signed up for Hunting Gear Deals email list so you're getting those every day. Um, if you're not signed up, you're going to be missing out on, on some of the best deals. doesn't cost anything, and uh, you can just check that email real quick in the morning, and if there's nothing you're interested in, then kind of move on for the day. But if you're into finding deals like I am, then then you'll be interested in that. Uh, let's just jump into this interview. I uh, had a great time talking to Jeff, and uh, we're going to have another episode coming out real soon. I actually just got off the phone with Kyle Bennett and Brian Grossman. So I'm not going to wait another two weeks or anything to put that episode out. We did like a quick preseason episode. So I've been talking hunting all night and uh, I'm really pumped about getting the season going. All right, everybody. I am really excited to have Jeff Danker on the line. He is somebody that when we first started the podcast, like three years ago, he was one of the top guys on my list. And, uh, you know, (laughs) Sometimes it takes a hard time, hard time to get through your list. And uh, fortunately, I was able to meet Jeff at ATA this year, and he said he'd love to come on the show with me. So, welcome to the show, Jeff. Man, Mike, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm glad I'm on the top of the list. I like being on the top of the list. <laughs> you were on top of it for about three years, <laughs> so it's, it's good to, good to hold it off so we could uh, <laughs> have, yeah. keep you keep you on the top there. the The reason I wanted to have you on is just from from seeing some of your TV shows. And hearing you speak in the past and some other podcasts is I know that you've got a heart of a teacher and um, you're not one of those TV guys that uh, wants to go just show up and sit over a green field in a, in a muddy blind or whatever the brand and name is going to be and, uh, and wait for the, the buck to show up that's named by the property owner. Uh, you're a guy that gets out there and gets it done and, and likes to talk about the strategy of it. So I think this will be a real interesting yeah. conversation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, I mean, you know, I think us hunters, we're all different in, in, in different ways. You know, some people are go to outfitters, different things, and nothing against any of that. My deal is I've always liked to hang my own stands, figure out the whole strategy, the cat and mouse game. And, and really that's what kind of turns me on. Yeah. I mean, even I know with the show, a lot of times you'll even need to say you, you'll work together with an outfitter, but it's always a situation where you show up and it, it's like, all right, go figure it out. You know, it's not like uh, yeah. pre-hung stands and all that kind of stuff for you. Um, yeah, a lot of times, I mean, you know, if you go to Canada, you have to have an outfitter. You know, it's a law. So those type deals, even when we went to Canada, you know, I'd send 10 stands over there. And, and then when we'd get there, we'd have those sets to go hang and maneuver and, and you know, again, play that, play that cat and mouse game. And it would yeah, be one of those big deer. And, you know, having the deer there is, is a big part of the puzzle when you're, when you're doing TV. So it's, it's cool that you're able to go there, but then you kind of see the whole process from the beginning. So, um, I guess why don't you tell us right now, uh, I know you're out hunting right now. I'm, I'm catching you in between hunts. So what are you working on right now? 
Well, so a couple things, Mike, I'll talk to you a little bit is, uh, you know, Buck Ventures, obviously we've been doing this since 2003 and, and it's, um, man, it's, it's doing really good. It's, uh, one of the top rated shows on the Sportsman's Channel. Uh, we've really partnered with Sportsman's Channel and, uh, my, and, and Outdoor Channel, uh, with some different things coming up. So, uh, with Buck Ventures going good, we're fixing to host, uh, Deer Week. So anybody that's going to be watching Sportsman's Channel, outdoor channel september 16th that whole week you'll see me and and country and western singer john langston all week hosting that so that's pretty cool dude everybody will get to see that and then you know we're working on uh, we got a brand new series coming out mike called the woodsman that we are pumped about it's only on my outdoor tv uh we partnered up with sportsman channel and, and outdoor channel with it and they're going to drop 10 brand new episodes on it um I think October 15th, I think they're going to be dropped three at a time. Um, and then we're working on um, a brand new deal right now. I'm not even going to say the name of the show, um, but it has to do with public land. And that's what I'm doing up here in Nebraska. Um, you know, I've had many, many um, people over the years, whether haters, you know, that saying, oh, I shot a buck and high fence, or just really guys that's following me to say, Jeff, would you ever consider hunting public land and, and just seeing that and you know, it was always kind of intrigued me and and then here we are today uh we're in nebraska we're filming for a brand new show um i can't tell too much about it but uh it'll it'll be coming out next year and it'll be all about public so that's what we're doing and i, I gotta say it's uh i respect the boys that are hunting public land that's for sure <laughs> i I'm I'm pretty excited about the whole new kind of market for public land hunting. Obviously, there's always been kind of somewhat of a demand for it, but I've never blamed, you know, TV show hosts for for hunting private land or that kind of stuff because what pays the bills is every what everybody wanted to see was a kill shot. And what's kind of evolved, and I think even when back when you do a major league bow hunter, there was kind of some of in between with that where you're doing some of the teaching as well. But I think a lot of hunters have gotten to the point where you know, they're kind of tired of just seeing big bucks get killed over and over and, and they're well, wanting to learn more from it. Uh, so it's, it's exciting that there's actually a market for that. So guys like you can put that kind of content out. Well, and I, that's exactly right, Mike. I mean, in this deal here, I mean, to me with the hunting and, and TV and all that mixed in is as a TV host, you still got to be you no matter what you do. You know, obviously we're, we're making a living doing this. We've been fortunate enough to do that, but it's just like last year, I went after a public land bull. I mean, the last two years I, I did that. And that wasn't for you. It wasn't for the audience. That was for me. And obviously the cameras follow that. And, and that's what we're doing here is, is this we do want to teach. I mean, I grew up with a dad that took me coon hunting at four years old. And, and I mean, just it really just sparked an interest in me. And then from cow hunting and all that. But when it comes to deer hunting and playing the wind and knowing what to do, you know, there wasn't any in-depth teaching. So that's always what I wanted to do. You know, you say I have the heart of a teacher. I mean, I do. I want people. And, and the same thing with this, this new show about public land. It will show when we get done, it will show how much it costs for us to hunt. It will show how much the tag costs. You know, it, we're not going to drop a pin exactly where we're hanging stands or hunting <laughs> gillies, but we're going to give that information to, to help people because we do want people hunting. I mean, we're in a, in a world of people that's declining and I want to do everything in my, my power to help that and to show people, because I do get a lot of them. Hey, yeah, you got all that land. If I had that land, you know, and, and I'm not necessarily, I'm not going to quit hunting my private land. I, I'm not stupid. I mean, I've, I've worked too hard to have that good ground. So I'm still going to shoot, you know, hopefully some big bucks in the future there as well. But we're going down this deal to help educate, and, you know, we're, we're out here right now getting our tail kicked. And, um, but we're learning a lot. And that's what we're going to portray on this new show exactly what we've learned and how to help someone go to, out and hunt public ground, no matter what state. Well, I can't wait to see that. So uh, tell me a little bit about my, my Outdoor TV. That's like an online only platform, right? Yes, sir. So that's a digital only. It's uh, owned by My Outdoor Group, which owns, my, uh, which owns Outdoor Channel and Sportsman Channel. And that's an app that you have to have. And, and you know, just to, to give a little bit of secret, I mean, there's a, I can't say the name, but there's another big outfit show that's going to be dropping a new series on there, I think October 1st, and then ours drops October 15th. So, 
you know, if someone's listening, they don't have that. I think it's nine dollars or whatever, and it ain't very much. Uh, but you can you can watch a lot of you know, and that's what we're doing with Outdoor Channel now is instead of just having my outdoor TV where you can see all the and you can see all the episodes, the Buck Ventures or whatever you want to watch, but we're doing a lot of stuff now with Outdoor Channel, and a lot of people are that's original series only. Yeah, yeah, because. I mean, really, I I don't need to pay you know one hundred and fifty dollars a month just for a couple channels that I'm gonna watch on cable. So I really like the idea of yeah. you know, be able to narrow in. Well, maybe I'd pay ten bucks just for outdoor content. So that's pretty cool. Right. Well, and I mean, you know, heck, back in the day when I first started, everybody watched me on TV. I bet eighty five percent of them now watch me on on a tele, you know, on a phone. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, so uh, being a Southern hunting podcast, uh, we focus on on whitetail a whole lot. So um, let's say you're doing one of these episodes in on um, public land somewhere, somewhere in the South, uh, it could be Oklahoma or Texas or whatever, but can you just start us off with what your approach is to once you pick out a piece of ground, how, how do you approach before you even set foot on it? Well, so just, just to be straight up with everybody, I'm learning. Um, <laughs> but my, my, what my, my attempt is, I mean, first of all, I try to do as much leg work in my office or on my phone before I get anywhere. I mean, from, you know, find the maps, all that kind of stuff. And when you look at the maps, the biggest thing I say is, is, and this is a learning in progress, but those big, you know, if it's an orange deal showing all this public ground or whatever, and it's right by this town, those are the ones you need to stay away from, you know, find those little ones in different places, you know, and, and then talk to as many DNR guys as you can and, and find that out. And then, you know, Give some extra time if you can to get there and scout it. I mean, I would say, I mean, we came to this to shoot a, a deer up here in Nebraska opening day, and there's two, you know, there's a lot of people opening day. So you're having to deal. You can't just think about the deer. And, and I'll tell you the other thing is, if you think about how hard, find the hardest place to get to, and, and that little attractive that's not attractive or whatever, those are the types of, uh, of things I think as a public hunter. Now, there's a lot of public land. I mean, one thing that we learned about in Nebraska, there's 800,000 acres here, you know, so that's three, and there's 300 different spots to hunt, whether that's from your Eastern over there, right on the Iowa border, plum out West Nebraska. So, so there is areas for everyone to hunt, you know, all the comments that I've gotten over the years saying, well, I ain't got that kind of money. I ain't got this. That is what this is for. I'm going to learn all I can. We're going to have heartache along the way. And, um, you know, I, I just hope people will appreciate it because this is real as it gets. Well, and I think probably, you know, you say you're learning, but I think probably 98% of, of what you've learned over the years on private is going to be just the same on public. It's just a, the, the one key difference is just other hunters pressure and, and, and where yeah. to get to and where the good spots are. But, you know, a deer or deer, whether they're on public land or private. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think the little tactics, I mean, if a guy's hunting during the rut, you know, is, you know, watching maybe how you call because everybody calls, you know, and this and that, you know, there's little deals that, again, I'm going to journal as I go to be able to educate what I've learned, you know, and then, like I said, I'm going to really try to dig into what it costs to go on some of these things. I mean, you know, the cool thing about it is we're sitting in a, you know, an RV right now in Nebraska, you know, cost me $38 a night. Um, to be in this campsite. There's other hunters here in tents and different things. And uh, it's really cool to see that there is a lot of hunters out and, and they're trying to, you know, that they ain't got a lot of money, whatever resources, but they're out here. You know, we've seen some bucks fall and, 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 and guys. So, so again, just I just want to, to do my very best to kind of give back in a sense the education of what it might take to be able to do this. Are you, so are you solely looking for mule deer? Because my understanding is the the tags are good for either, right? Well, it is. I mean, and so what we've been doing a lot, and I would tell someone just the first education I would give is, you know, hunt your muleys in the mornings. And, uh, you know, if you're out this way, and then we're hunting whitetails in the evening. So okay. we'll, we'll be going, we, we, we're hunting whitetails tonight. Um, you know, a lot of standing corn and, and um uh, and so we're hunting pretty close to a lot of standing corn is what we're doing with both muleys and whitetails. Okay. Uh, so one thing I've heard you talk about a lot in the past is, is access. And I think that's going to be the same, whether it's, or it's public or private. Uh, so can you kind of give us a rundown on what you like to consider when you're going to access a stand? 
Well, I mean, the access to me is, uh, you know, I always talk about there's one best tree out there. And, you know, that that tree isn't the best hackberry that's right down in the creek there that, that just you look up at it while you're shit hunting and think, man, how wide a stand goes there. And it would look good, whatever. But the access to me, and especially, Mike, when you get after a specific deer or an older deer, is that access to be able to not only get in, but to get out. Um, is so critical. I mean, I think it's overlooked a lot. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people, again, back when I was young and I'd hear somebody talk about it, I didn't know what it meant. And I'm talking about walking in and, and, and making sure your wind's going in the right place as you're walking in, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, you're not going too deep or you're not, you know. And, again, there's different times, right? I mean, there's early season or, or when we get towards the rut. You know, someone might tag along with me during the rut and think I was the most aggressive hunter in the world because I do get really aggressive that time of year. And I, I penetrate a lot of stuff that people think I'm crazy. But that is the time of year to do it. I mean, that's when you can't hesitate. But, again, access their thing. I mean, if you – if you, I don't care if it's rut or whatever, and this is where mistakes are made from, from just guys. So when they walk in, and let's just say they got a north wind and they're walking in – and they got a destination field way over there to the south that's 400 yards away, and they think they can walk in with that north wind flooding that destination field in the dark, that's where those little things like that, just that, it don't matter if it's rut or whatever, you clear the field, you get things on alert, and, and that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So kind of going with that same idea in, in this early season we're talking about, you just mentioned hunting muleys in the morning, but let's say you're hunting on your own property, are you hunting mornings in the early season like this? You know, very seldom. I mean, there's there's times. I mean, there's times where I, you know, I get a, you know, I don't know if you call it a hunch or whatever, and I think, okay, I know this deer's on, you know, on this destination field. I can slip in here to his bedroom, and I can go in here after him. I mean, and one thing that I really like to do is, is especially hunting, again, back to that mature deer that I'm after, is, is I don't really hunt in a sense. I go in to kill. So if I'm thinking, okay, I got this hunch, I'm going in, I'm going to his bedroom in the morning, and, and I got a hunch, and I'm going in to kill. So let's say it doesn't work, then I'm getting my tail end out of there, and, uh, you know, I didn't get him killed, and it's back to the drawing board. But I'm not especially early. You know, someone, the biggest thing I could teach is don't just go hunt. You know, you've got to have that plan, and, and you know, I mean, if you're just going around – you know, I'm going to go set this stand early, and especially mornings. I mean, I I seldom hunt mornings, really, but only on those hunches, you know, and then using my evenings. Because, I mean, you know, it, when you're in the mornings, especially, let's say, especially if you're in Kansas, Oklahoma, and let's say there, there's some bait involved, I mean, you can't hardly do it. Um, and then, you know, the, the thing about these bucks this time of year, they're so sensitive if you start stepping on your, your, your hit list or if you will, then you're, you're probably losing for the year. If you are hunting one of those hunches, are you usually just trying to get as like tight to his where he's going to be bedding as you can and, and try to catch him coming back to bed? Well, and a lot of times too, with, you know, some of my ground, you know, from Kansas and Oklahoma, I'll be watching a deer. You know, I do, if anybody's ever listened to me at all, you always talk about observation stands. You know, I might be in a stand or on a hill somewhere looking you know, I might be in Oklahoma looking a mile across there of deer coming off an alpha field. I might be in Kansas looking 200 yards at something, you know, watching him. And, and, and I'm like, okay, I can go hang in that tree, hang and hunt, and maybe have a chance at him in the morning. Um, so I'm doing a lot of that. And then going back, if I'm back probably where you're talking about deep stuff, you know, it might be off a camera thinking, okay, man, he's been there. Uh, in the dark, you know, but we got this big cold front coming in and I'm on a chance at going in and try to catch him moving back right here on the edge of his friend's bed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe let's talk about observation sits a little bit more, how, how you use them as I guess, let's say you're, well, let's, let's kind of even go back further than that. So, um, you mentioned, okay, you found a piece of ground. Um, what is your strategy for scouting it? online before you get there and then when you show up what are you doing first when you're putting boots on the ground well if you know if we're talking public i'm i'm putting not even boots on the ground i'm putting tires to the, to the dirt i mean <laughs> i'm driving and driving and driving you know and and learning not only deer but i'm learning people 
and just seeing how many people we're dealing with on public ground. You know, if I'm if I'm hunting a private piece, I'm, uh, you know, again, what I just like to do. I mean, it's kind of two different worlds we're talking about, but you know, private is. I'm always going to hunt from the outside in. I mean, I take my time. I mean, I just uh, I'm going to hunt from the outside in, and and give them that inside core. I mean, I would tell somebody with 40 acres, you know, leave some something for the deer. I'm talking about only one time a year walking. You know, I mean, again, I know we're dealing with people that are hunting Uncle Joe's pasture over here that's doing this or whatever, but in, in, in the perfect sense, if you can leave the deer that sanctuary, you know, hunt from the outside in, and then, you know, we mentioned observation, but even in a thick piece, you might be out here on the fringe, and then you're starting to see movement back in the timber there, and well, then you inch in with your, your stands being careful, because, I mean, again, I just, I, I may even give these big bucks too much respect i just you know to some people but to me i don't think you can give them enough respect yeah but it seems to me like when you'll you'll work your way in but when it's when it's time to when you know where that deer is going to be you it seems like you don't mess like you go in knowing like okay i'm going to kill him tonight this is where i need to be and and you go in and do it well and that's the deal i mean it's it, it, again it you know people ask me how do you know jeff where all these deer are how do you know where they bed well, dude i ain't no I'm just, I'm, I'm a guessing like so many, but they're educated guesses and they're, they're, then it's a plan that you go do, you know, when they watch me on television, you know, I, I they see me for 22 minutes and, you know, you kill the deer or whatever, and they think that's how it goes, but it's not, you know, there's many of these hunches that I do that don't pan out. So again, whether I've watched the deer come off out of field, yeah, when it's time to go, I don't care if it's midnight and I got to go and hang that set that night. I don't care what it takes. I don't care if it's a rut in Iowa. We're going to go. We're going to we're going to come up with that plan, and we're going to go. And that's the one thing I would tell someone: don't you know, come up with it, and it and it may bite you, but but have that plan. I think so many people are hunting today without a plan. I mean, they they you know they're just going to a stand, and and that's what gets you in trouble. You have to have. You know, again, I can't tell you every time where a deer is exactly going to show up, but I can have a plan to say, I'm going to come in this way with the wind in my face. I think that deer's bedding right here and a very educated guess if that's the thickest place. I got pictures coming from here or whatever it might be. And those are the kinds of plan. But yeah, you're exactly right. When it's time, you go and, and get after it. So in the, we're coming up just about at the season starting for, for a lot of people. And, uh, so we got, uh, it's not just public land hunters to listen to the podcast. We got a lot of guys that are on leases. There's a lot of guys that have small pieces of private. I mean, it runs a whole gambit. So when you're not just public, but just in general, in the early season, what are you focusing most on, you know, before we get into the pre-rut period? Well, probably, I mean, I would say this for anybody, if you want to shoot a big deer, the, the best time is early. I mean, when you can pattern them. And, and, and so my number one focus mike is to find it i mean there's many times i'm not even hanging sets on some of my properties right now all i'm doing is trying to find that deer uh whether that's from observation whether that's from you know cameras over corn or if i can't use corn i'm cutting down a little leaves and, and throwing them on the ground throwing cameras maybe on trail water hole whatever trying to find that big deer and when i find him then i really hone in on on trying to, to hang sets or whatever and, and get, but, but again, uh, it, it's, it's the inventory. I mean, you know, you take Joe blow from the South down there and he don't have the inventory Well, he crawls up and he's staying at a one thirty walks out. Well, he's probably going to kill him. And yeah. so if you have the inventory, knowing that dang, that deer's running with a one sixty, that is what, you know, and that's probably where I got more hate from, from people seeing if I passed a one sixty. And they're mad at me because they're like, no one can do that. Well, I can't do it either. Back in the old day, with the technology that I have today, and I can have cameras, and I know there's a 185 there, and I got one tag, I can pass a 160. I think a lot of people can. So my main deal is, first of all, everybody needs to set their own goals. And and whatever that goal is, if that's just going to shoot a deer, go do it. And don't care what anybody says. But if you want to shoot a bigger deer, then get that inventory and it'll help you uh, with staying in the stand longer. It'll actually even help you to make sure you're playing those wins better because you don't want to mess up. 
And and so that's my number one thing right now is inventory. I mean, obviously I got stands in place in a lot of places, but you know I'm I'm sitting here ready, knowing when a big deer pops up on one of my properties that I might have to move in and, and hang a set. When do you typically start hanging trail cameras? You know, with me, it's it's uh, it seems like Mike it gets earlier every year. You know, I uh, I got quite a bit of property, so we got cameras stressed from Ohio to you know. Oklahoma and everywhere in between, but uh, you're probably looking. I, I usually around the fourth. I'm always July fourth. I'm always gonna have cameras, and most time it's even before then. And especially some of my bigger places or my better places, you know, maybe mid June. But but July fourth is uh, you can sure tell what what deer are. Yeah, are you running a lot of cell cameras or just traditional cameras for the most part? No, I am. I'm running, you know, I, I do a lot of traditionals as far as uh, in, in places where I'm just doing inventory, but then the cell cameras, I think I'm running about six. And, um, you know, I got them in places that I sure enough don't want to intrude very often. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that 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 is the key, man. If a, if a guy can afford these cell cameras, and one thing just to educate a little bit on them, it scares everybody. They think, well, I got to get this plan or whatever, but I got these six cameras, and I think it cost me $24 a month for the first one. And then I think it's $5 uh, per ever after that. So $24 for the initial deal, and then $5 per camera after that. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and, it, and, and you can shut it off anytime you want. Uh, I'm running coverts. Okay. Um, okay. You know, so after season's over, you can shut it off, and it's done, and you're ready. You know, you just wait till the next year to kick them back on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the great thing about that, it's not even so much getting, I mean, it's nice to get real time data, but to me, the biggest thing is you, you don't have to go in there to check it. So you hang it once no. and you stay out of there until you're going to hunt it. Yeah. And that's right. I mean, it's just, it's a no brainer. I mean, it's uh with that kind of technology that send them right to your phone and you're exactly right. It's, I, I mean, I got to watch myself, you know, being on my phone too much or, you know, <laughs> I got to spend time with my wife. So I kind of put it down, but it, it is awesome in that way, but the biggest thing, like I said, you don't have to go in there. Yeah. Um, are you, do you typically hang a camera like right where you might hunt or you try to stay back a ways and try to, you know, backtrack in your mind where they're coming from? Well, inventory is one thing that I try to teach a lot is not necessarily, you don't have to hang these cameras where even you're going to hunt. I mean, in other words, let's just say I got alfalfa field, uh, that is, uh, you know, 600 yards from, where a lot of my sets are and these are this is actually a farm that i'm thinking about in my head so i might go around an alfalfa field and put two or three cameras up there and pour three four hundred pounds of corn out in front of each of them and all i'm doing is getting inventory i can pull in there as a farmer you know because there's tractors there and there's just then i just pull in my truck midday i check those cameras throw more cameras or corn out and then i'm just checking that inventory so i get a 180 on that alfalfa field, well, big whoop, he's 600 yards from my stand. But now I just, again, back to that educated guess, where's this deer bedding? Where's the thick stuff? Well, you know, and then I might be running cell cameras at my sets there where I'm going to hunt. But but for the majority, again, I would just, I think that the technology of a cell camera or a, the, the, let's just say the technology of a trail camera is the best that we've, you know, revolutionizing hunting right up until the point that someone's in even once a week is too much. You know, you, these big bucks are so, they don't like to be messed with, man. I mean, and, and, and these guys, I got three and they, you know, I got a big buck, got to give a big buck and then they're in there three, four days a week, whatever. And for long, their neighbor kills him because they, this, this buck, I mean, I just seen it happen time and time again. And that's what people again, back to giving these big deer the respect that they need because they, all they are is there's a bunch of lazy, you know, they, they want to be by themselves. They don't want to be messed with. And when you start doing that, you're in trouble. Okay. So a couple, couple last things you talked about moving around some, uh, can you tell us about your hunting setup a little bit, what you use to hunt out of? Well, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, hanging hunt is a lot, but we, you know, on our power farms, obviously I have stands in place. I mean, we run X stands, um, and we are, uh, you know, from the little stands to the big stands. Um, but mainly, like I said, is, uh, I'm always ready to move. I mean, we're used, 
you know, still to this day, I use, you know, I use some, some quick, quick climbing sticks. Uh, but even I like screwing still to this day. I mean, and I'll just tell you this, I mean, as anybody listening, I just want you to make sure and, uh, you know, growing up a roofer, I'm not scared of heights, never have been, but these safe climb ropes, I just, every time I get a chance to tell somebody about that, I just, just get them. They don't cost very much and, and you can get in and out of these sets. I mean, as many stands as we are in every year, I mean, I try to have them in every set, but, but again, moving around, staying safe, but, but, you know, many times too, Mike, I mean, I've killed many, many deer of, of setting in an observation stand, knowing I probably wouldn't kill that night, watching a deer cross my face from left to right, him going out of sight and knowing he's going to the destination field. And then I pull that set and go right to where he just came out of that cut block or whatever, yeah. hang that set and then backdoor him in there that morning. So in other words, I do all that. He ain't got a clue. He's in the destination field all night long. And then he shows right back up at daylight and there I sit. And I've killed so many like that. Are you climbing down like, well, it's still light and hanging that, or you'll finish out that hunt and then basically set up in the dark? No, I, I, let's just say it crosses my face 15 minutes before dark. I'm at least given an hour. Okay. You know, he's going across my face, uh, you know, and I, I see that, I mean, in particular, one night, one happened that I killed is in Alberta that he crossed my face right at dark. And, and so at dark, we ain't got no light left. And my camera guy's sitting there thinking, hey, ain't we going to leave? And I said, no, we're sitting here in the dark. <laughs> and I could I could take my binoculars and I could I could see that field. My binoculars, all I did was stare at it. And it was probably 20 minutes after dark, and I seen a big-bodied blob. And I seen, you know, he had headgear, but I thought in my mind that was him. And I let him cross there. He went on to the, to the destination fields, and we got down about 45 minutes later. And, and I'd done seen some deer come out kind of where he was coming from. And we went and hung a set. I went out the other way, come back in the morning and he showed back up that morning. I killed him. And so a lot of times it's in the dark. I mean, I would tell a lot of that, even to this day around my house, I check my cameras a lot of times in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, I just think it's a good time to go in the middle of the night. Usually he's up on his feet. Deer like to go to open fields at night, chew their cud. They can see predators coming this and that. So if you got sands hung the timber and you want to slip in and check cameras, you know, maybe you got to, you know, refresh corn piles, whatever it is, I think that's a good time in the middle of the night. Now, again, not right in the evening. Just make sure everybody's clear. But, you know, I'm talking about if it gets dark at, say, 630, I might be going at 1030, 11 o'clock checking cameras. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting how deer, you know, you could walk like walk right up to them almost and have a, a light shining right in their face, yeah. and they won't if it's, yeah. if it's dark, yeah. dark, you know. Yeah, um, right, exactly. And I don't know how the uh, you know I, I imagine ground scent maybe would would have some effect, but I don't even know if they get a spook just by smelling you in in the middle of the night like that. They just have no. I mean, it. again, right in the evening they do. Yeah, you know that's why a lot of times if a guy sets, let's say you're hunting a big deer, and let's just say you went in with that hunch that I'm talking about, and it don't happen don't there's, there's two scenarios that i like to do on that deal so you went in you went after this big buck he didn't show up so let's say it's coming on dark and you know that it ain't happening and you can glass around and all of a sudden you can say listen we can get out immediately without bumping something you can do that the other scenario let's say you got some does or whatever and just you got to maybe give that to get to that dark that you're talking about maybe stay in your stand 30 to 45 minutes after daylight or or, you know, after it's gotten dark and let it get to that kind of dark you're talking about where deer aren't as scared because you're exactly right. And a lot of people don't know that, but you're exactly right. I've walked up to deer in the dark, whatever. But when you get around that daylight time and you spook him, then you're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Which, but, you know, that maybe that goes to support some of these some of these guys who get in super early and they go sit in their, their stand for an hour before light, which... Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of those catch 22s to me because that I, I kind of see there could be diminishing returns there too, because that means your scent's hanging out all that time too while you're. Well, you're and just I, I'm, there, but... I'm probably with you more on that. I like the even staying late if you got to. In the mornings, I'm, uh, you know, I just be honest, I ain't an hour guy. I don't, I'm <laughs> not that. I mean, usually, usually we're uh, finished up touching points and I start to see in the mornings. Uh, <laughs> 
you know. I haven't seen the evidence enough to make it worth it to me. I'll just say that. If, yeah. If I knew. Well, I mean, there's times. Get up at any time in the night you need me to. But yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, there's times when you get that, you know, say you got a 15, 20 mile hour breeze. And you know a deer's coming in off destination fields, coming back in to, to your cut block or whatever. You know, there's many times I'll get there real early because I don't want something, you know, maybe does coming in, whatever. And But I got that consistent wind. And, and really with that consistent wind, I mean, that's something we've talked about a lot, you know. But that consistent big wind kills more deer. And it, and it goes back to exactly what you're saying. Instead of being in your set, and, and thinking you got all this scent hovering around you because you've been there too long. When you get them 20 mile an hour winds, which I probably killed more deer in than, than anything, that that's going one way. It's getting out of there. And that's so key to so many people that think, oh man, I want that still morning, that big frosty still morning. And, and not that you can't kill deer there, but a lot of times it can get you in trouble. And especially a still evening is way worse. All right. So I already kept you too long. I got one one last question for you. So this set, when you when you move at in, in the dark and you set up this new set, and let's say you set there the next morning, how many times are you usually going to sit that set until you kind of give up on it? Yeah, obviously there's going to be some variables in there, but it, do right. you typically only sit something one time, or? Well, I mean, so there's you know the big thing there, Mike, is if there's times I've done that, and let's just say I do that, and I get there the next morning, and all of a sudden. You know, here come the deer or, or something, and, and I, I can see they're on edge. I can see something I did didn't work. I see that maybe they're, they're passing me on the wrong side of the tree. You know, so obviously, I, I immediately, I'm like, dude, this we missed. So, and then the other's just a hunch. Let's just say I go in there and it didn't happen. You know, maybe I, I just feel like, you know, the weather wasn't perfect or whatever. I mean, I, I will continue because I, I know that he's betting there. Just like the scenario that I was talking about, I know the deer was betting in that, that wood, the, the, that cut block there. And so, you know, I, I, I just want to be using my head. And again, I, I play a lot of just what I think. I mean, you know, I want perfect conditions. I'm, I'm not going to be iffy with my winds. Um, you know, now, I will say this, and not very many people have heard me say this, because I've always preached the wind so much, and so I'm going to kind of let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned muddy blinds. Um, you know, I'll just tell you, we're using those a lot, you know, especially on my Oklahoma stuff and even my Kansas stuff, and, and where, um, you know, again, I hate to even put this out there, but I'm going to because it's the truth what we're doing. There's times when we might be able to push the edge with these blinds. Yeah. In other words, you know, you can get in these blinds, get in there early, get them buttoned up, and and you're going to contain your scent way more. Now we're running the dead zone from from uh, you know dead down wind. We're spraying down. We're we're trying to take care of all the details. And again, I've always preached the wind, but I always preach the details as well and do all that stuff. But when you when it's a lot of times we got them big deer and we're like, dude, this is right. We just got an iffy wind. And and again, it goes back to a hunch. It's not that I'm telling everybody going, Oh, Jeff said you can go to the muddy blind and just shut it up and you can play any wind. That's not what I'm saying. But you can use those tactics and kill big deer. I think ozone's a game changer. I mean, I, I don't personally run anything myself, but I do believe that it that it works to an extent. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh especially yeah. in, in a closed area like that. I mean, it's it is scientific that it that it kills the, mm -hmm. you know, right. kills the bacteria and stuff. Well, that causes and, odor, odor, so. And it's, I would say this, I'd say if me and you had a bet and you said, listen, Jeff, I'm not going to play the wind, but I'm going to use ozone and I'm going to use real tree camo and all this stuff, but you're not going to play the wind. And I could say, well, I'm going to wear perfume and, uh, I'm going to play the wind. I still believe I beat you. Yeah. But you take a hunter that plays the wind and uses all that stuff and takes care of the details. I, I truly believe that 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 helps you. I mean, it's it's just all about details. It's all it's not rocket science. It's about details. Having a plan and not just. I mean, I always tell people when you're walking in those bow sets, stop at 80 yards. Just stop and just say, okay. Remember, Jeff said stop at 80 yards and and just start thinking, and and you know, making sure you're not handsy, not touching anything. You know, that you're thinking, okay, I got this win. Where's he going to be? And make sure those footprints are in the right place when you get to that stand, that kind of stuff. I mean, that it's just about details. Well, I think that is some really good advice to close up on. I, I appreciate you squeezing me in in between hunts, and uh, I, I wish you the best of luck tonight. 
Well, Mike, you stay in touch, and if I can ever be a help, uh, you or anybody that needs it, I'm always here. Yeah, well, I'd love to do this again. Is uh, what? So what's the best way uh, the listeners can support you right now with, with all the stuff you got coming up? Well, I tell you guys, anybody's listening, I mean, you know, follow me on Instagram, and, and that's where my main personal deal is. I mean, the Buck Ventures deal, you know, uh, my field producer, Cole, uh, takes care of that. So he, me and him are right on top of that. So those two things, um, you know, follow us on and then just, man, get on my outdoor TV and support us with the, the new woodsman show. And, and then I, I just can't wait to, uh, to unleash everything that'll be coming with this new show as well. So, I mean, I just, you know, I just asked for the show's support. In October? And, well, the woodsman's coming in October. Oh, it is. That's okay. the new wood. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. That's the, that'd be crazy. Yeah, production so this October, we've already filmed for it. Yep. Uh, it's it's already in the deal and it's already in production, so that that you'll start seeing it probably around um, October first, just being flooded all over Sportsman Channel and Outdoor Channel advertising the Woodsman. Okay, uh, you know coming. So, you know, and again, I'm I just want truly, Mike. What I'm after is to educate, humbly educate as many people as I can. Not that I've got it all figured out, but you know, I, we are trying to do it like anybody can do it. Again, you know, I got some good ground. I've worked to get it. Um, but, you know, it might even be a podcast we can do later on how to get good ground because I truly believe I have a lot of insight to how you can get good ground without paying for it. Well, you and I both know no matter what you do, there's there's going to be some haters, and especially if you're willing mm-hmm. to say the name Jesus every once in a while, then, then you're really going to some people, so. Um, all right I well that's, appreciate you know what you're if you follow doing. me i'm gonna definitely say that yeah <laughs> well well thank you so much jeff and uh yeah we'll definitely keep in touch all right mike thanks so much and uh, god bless you brother all right god bless we're out down south